This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Hi there, welcome aboard the train we like to call the Ag Express. He's Kenny, I'm Ray, and as always, our promise to you, the latest and greatest in Georgia agriculture. That's right, coming up, despite the low prices, why soybean growers feel that 2018 will be a great year. Also on the program, some high-stakes excitement at the District 2 Livestock Show, and that was even before it officially kicked off. Damon Jones on the amount of teamwork it takes to put this event together. And then later, a trip to Jackson, Georgia to check out the comfy digs of its newest celebrity, General Beauregard Lee the Groundhog. Why Dawson Trails Nature Center is the perfect fit for the state's favorite weather prognosticator. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. As you know, Georgia is one of the leading cotton producers in the nation, and the crop has a huge impact on the state's economy. Recently in Tipton, growers gathered for the Georgia Cotton Commission's annual meeting to discuss imported information that will help keep the industry profitable. John Holcomb has the report. At the University of Georgia's Tipton Campus Conference Center, quite a crowd gathered for a meeting about Georgia's cotton, which is vital to the Georgia ag industry. Cotton is very important to Georgia's ag industry. It's the number one row crop. It produces most revenue than any other row crop in the state. At the annual meeting, everyone in the industry got a chance to fellowship, go around to vendors, and attend workshops on various topics. The main attraction, though, is the meeting where people in the cotton industry explain what all is happening in the world of cotton. One of those people, Cater Hake, a researcher with Cotton Incorporated, that brought some news producers wanted to hear. There's a huge amount of optimism within the cotton community. Not just the things that they see, which is uh, decent yields despite all the adverse weather that you had, and a decent price considered the large carryover. I mean, that's what they see. There are bigger issues because cotton is this competition with polyester, and growers don't see that, but those bigger issues are looking really, really optimistic. One of the bigger issues he's referring to is the environmental impacts the polyester industry is causing, like microplastics, which is now found in water samples all over the ocean and are being consumed by fish. Small fish eat them, big fish eat those small fish, bigger fish eat the, those medium-sized fish, and then we eat the big fish. And so all that gets bioaccumulated up to us, and they're throughout the ocean right now. Hake also explained how with that pollution happening, it's helping the cotton industry due to people wanting to make conscientious buying decisions. When they purchase something, they want to feel good about that purchase beyond just receiving a product. They want to feel like they are supporting an industry which is responsible. He also mentioned how research is helping demand for cotton after new studies have found that cotton seed is beneficial to people's health. What the scientists at University of Georgia have just done is they've really drilled down into cottonseed oil and found that it's, that's extremely healthy for, for it's heart healthy, it's, it's great on the cholesterol problems and the triglycerides and, and, um, and it reduces the, 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 how hungry you are. So it has a lot of benefits that were not known. Producers also got a chance to hear about communication efforts taking place in the industry. Stacey Gorman, Director of Communications for the Cotton Board, spoke to producers on how they're using TV commercials and social media to increase the demand and profitability for cotton. We um, use a variety of tactics to reach today's consumer to encourage them to seek out cotton and ultimately purchase cotton. That's, that's the goal. We want them to be aware of cotton and its benefits and then uh, move beyond awareness into action and actually purchase cotton. Gorman also explained their efforts in communicating not with just consumers, but also to producers to make sure they see the work that is being done to promote the product they're growing. So we have a team of regional communication managers that go and they do on-farm visits. They go to grower meetings um, and they speak at industry events just to keep our producers updated on what's going on. Reporting from the Georgia Cotton Commission Conference in Tifton for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Thank you, John. Meantime, while soybean planting is still months away, growers from around the state gathered in Perry recently for the annual Georgia-Florida Soybean and Small Grain Expo. 
While low prices have the crop acreage in the state at an all-time low, there is still plenty of optimism heading into the new year. The top five growers from the yield contest averaged 94 bushels, which is incredible soybean yield. The winner was actually over 110 bushels. In today's market, and if it's managed properly, that can be a very profitable crop. But across the state, I think a main issue to, to work on um, is scouting for pests and, and applying pesticides or fungicides at the right time. And while it's not one of the larger soybean producers in the country, Georgia still had more than 140,000 acres planted in 2017. Well, true, the Junior National Livestock Show in Perry gets most of the attention every year. But did you know there are still regional events taking place throughout the state at any given time? And one of the larger ones was recently held in White County, where more than 74-H and FFA students got a chance to show off their projects. Damon Jones has the story. There was plenty of grazing, grooming, and grading at the White County Agri-Science Center as students and parents from 14 different counties made the trip to Cleveland, Georgia for the annual District 2 Livestock Show. And with more than 130 head of cattle being shown, it's an event that didn't just come together overnight. This is, takes several months of planning. Um, we have volunteers that help uh, bring in all the entries, calculate all of those into computer systems so that uh, when we're here at the morning of the show that everything is lined up um, for the livestock show. And the payoff for all that hard work and planning is getting a chance to recognize these deserving students for their effort and dedication over the past year. The, the beauty of the show is this gives another opportunity for 4-H and FFA members to come out with their families and exhibit their projects. Um, here at the Livestock Show, we also, rec also recognize some seniors and give away some scholarships. However, it's not just prizes and recognition that makes showing livestock worthwhile, as it also teaches these participants valuable life lessons. Uh, I think it just creates great kids. I think it, it teaches them responsibility. It teaches them how to win and lose, uh, how to be judged, and, and how to walk out of the ring with your head held high, whether you're on the top or the bottom. Uh, but just the responsibility, the uh, and, and what kid, what, what they learn from that, and take that on with them to be successful for their. For their their whole life. Showing livestock uh, to me and, and for me personally sets, sets a foundation. Um, whether you're looking for a career in agriculture or you're going into the medical field or wherever you land, um, showing livestock sets a foundation for responsibility and learning to take care of something other than yourself. While raising an animal requires great patience and hard work, it truly is a labor of love for these students. He is. He loves it. Uh, I couldn't be more blessed. Uh, he just absolutely loves it. I don't have to ask him twice if I say, let's go to the barn. He's ready. Uh, and it's, it's just about every day of the week that we're working with calves or doing something in the barn to, uh, to make him better and, and, and to, to be successful. It's not just the students that had to put in the time and effort, as parents are also important to the success. It's quality time being spent together that will last a lifetime. Uh, the memories are unreal. Uh, you know, I dread it. I guess I look forward to him growing up, but I dread it as well. Uh, just the memories, the, the winning. He won the fair this year, so that was huge. Then we didn't expect that. Um, they're just, it's just unlimited is the memories that we can make here and, and the, the things that we can build on for a lifetime. While it is ultimately a competition, there is a sense of camaraderie among those in attendance. Uh, we're around with a great bunch of people uh, that just enjoy what we do. Uh, the families and everything that we, that we meet uh, on the road as we travel, uh, it's just, I don't think it gets any better than this. Uh, you can play sports and sports are great, but this is something that a family can do together weekend, every weekend and, and build on. Reporting from White County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. All right, thank you, Damon. Well, needless to say, they are hog wild for the general in Jackson, Georgia. When we come back, Ray gives us a behind the scenes look at Dawson Trails Nature Center and why they say it was a dream come true to acquire the state's weather predicting groundhog, General Beauregard Lee. My name is Ian Bennett. I'm the 2017-2018 National FFA Southern Region Vice President. I grew up in Hay Hira, Georgia, and kind of the way I, I got involved in agriculture was really on my family's farm back home. 
I come from a, a third generation pure red Charlie operation and I really started working out there uh, just about as soon as I could walk. I joined the FFA in the sixth grade at, at Hay Howard Middle School. Um, I really just got started involved with that uh, just because my dad suggested I take an ag ed class and in taking an ag, ag class he joined the FFA and my ag teacher got me involved. I did a couple public speaking events, got started showing livestock and, and really when I got to into the seventh grade and into high schools I started competing in the agri-science fair and that's really kind of when I I found my stride in the FFA, I guess. So the, the National FFA organization is, is one of the largest student-led organizations in the nation. So having said that, I'm one of six student leaders for this organization. I'm going to take a year off of school. Um, I'm a junior at the University of Georgia, so I'll be taking a spring semester and a fall semester off. Um, I'll spend about 300 days out of the next year on the road. I'll travel over 100,000 miles. Uh, we'll give somewhere in the neighborhood of about 65 different facilitated workshops, whether that's you know, going to a school and, and teaching a lesson in the classroom, or that's putting on a conference for some state officers from all across the nation. And then I'll keynote about 100 different events throughout the year. Uh, since about the seventh grade on, I always knew that, that trying to run for national office was something that I wanted to do. So it was something that I've worked really hard for for a really long time to get here. Um, but you know, up until, up until that moment where they called my name out and I got to run up on stage, I wasn't really sure if it was ever going to work out. The thing I'm looking forward to the most is just the opportunities I'm going to have in front of me over the next year. You know, like I said, I'm going to be on the road for over 300 days out of the next year. Uh, so each, each and every day is going to bring a new opportunity and a, and a new challenge and a new way for me to grow. Um, and a new opportunity for me to go out there and, and make a difference. As a national officer, I really want to help our students take advantage of all those opportunities and be as successful as they can possibly be. So whether that means helping someone compete in a CDE event, whether that means you know, helping somebody write a speech when they're trying to run for area or chapter office, I just want to be there and be available to our members to help them take advantage of every opportunity. Well, Groundhog Day 2018, a success depending on who you ask. If you hate the cold, then Sorry, folks, General Beauregard Lee, our state's beloved groundhog, emerged from his new home at Dawson Trails Nature Center in Jackson and saw his shadow, which, of course, means six more weeks of winter. And for the record, Bo has correctly predicted the forecast over 90% of the time. That, my friends, is a better forecasting percentage than his cousin, Puxatani Phil. Now, as mentioned, Bo's new home is located in Jackson, Georgia at the Dawson Trails Nature Center. The change of address necessary after his former home, the Yellow River Game Ranch in Lilburn, unexpectedly closed its doors back in December. And let me tell you, the folks at Dawson Trails are ecstatic they were chosen as Bo's new caretakers. However, as you are about to see, getting everything ready for him and for Groundhog Day was no easy task. We saw on the news, just like everyone else, where Yellow River Game Ranch was going out, were, were closing their doors, and we were like, well, I wonder if we could get General Beauregard Lee, and it was kind of like, nah, we'll never get him. And then we kind of put the word out that we may be interested, and Georgia Department of Natural Resources worked with us, as well as uh, Yellow River Game Ranch, and all of a sudden on January 8th, we had us a groundhog. First of all, you gotta figure out Something about groundhogs. We, we didn't know a whole lot about groundhogs. They're not found right in this general area there in North Georgia. So we had to educate ourselves on, we had to learn a little bit about them and then we had to come up with a place to house them. So we had a, an Eagle Scout had just completed a gopher tortoise exhibit and we turned it into a groundhog exhibit and we're gonna use it through Groundhog's Day and then we're gonna construct him a really nice exhibit. Uh, the house was, uh, it was an old mansion, old antebellum home, so of course it had some work to be done. It just wasn't, it wasn't, we weren't able to move it, so we said, well, let's just build them a new home. So we started from scratch, so uh, the house is eight by eight by six, a little over six foot tall and super cushy. And having earned his DWP, Doctorate of Weather Prognostication, Bo could not have found a better place to call his new home. Here at Dawson Trails, he is free from predators, he's got a fancy new home, and there is a ton of stuff to do here. All of our animals are either injured or orphaned, non-releasable. For whatever reason, they can't be in the wild. Uh, another neat thing about our animals is they're all Georgia natives. So we, we don't have exotics here. You're not gonna come see giraffes. Um, we've got beautiful gardens. Of course, our gardens are kind of, this isn't the optimal time of the year to come see our gardens, but uh, you know, beautiful gardens. We've got a, a, a barnyard exhibit. At our barnyard, you're gonna learn 
about the production of livestock and a little bit about where our food comes from. I think that's important these days. People, there's a disconnect between what you're eating and where it came from. And we're doing our part here in between Macon and Atlanta, telling kids that a lot of times never leave the city that you know, our food has to be produced by farmers and that's what we're doing there. Our period is 19, late 1940s is what we try to shoot for. Um, we've got an old country store. Um, we do make syrup the Saturday before Thanksgiving, grind it with a mule and um, show the whole process then. We have blacksmithing demonstrations throughout, I think, you know, several times throughout the year. A lot, depending on weather, if it's 100 degrees, we don't, I don't make my guys blacksmith. <coughs> but uh, it's, we've got chickens, cows, goats, uh, mules, pigs. We are a private nonprofit. We're not a state park. A lot of people think that since Indian Springs is right down the road this way and High Falls is that way, well, we've got to be another state park. We're, we're private nonprofit. Um, as far as us getting Beauregard, we, we pride ourselves in top-notch exhibits or the best that we can do, uh, clean, well cared for animals. Bo is going to be no different. A lot of people are like, well, that's, that's not something that Dawson Trails does. Well, we stuck our necks out and we're, we're the home of Bo now. So. Uh, but he's going to be extremely well taken care of. He is going to be extremely well fed and, and, and fat and happy here. So he's going to be a, a happy groundhog. Yes, that is one spoiled groundhog. Well, chances are you've seen and heard them from time to time in your county. But up next, we're going to show you why auctioneers are truly artists and the important role they play in not only the ag industry, but the sales industry as well. So the Centers for Disease Control actually offered grants to land-grant universities and colleges um, where there were communities that had obesity rates of over 40 percent. And in Georgia, Tolliver County, and Calhoun were identified as targeted communities because of high obesity rates. We, we had to make them aware of it first. We, had, we shared the information, what CDC shared with us, uh, about the um, obesity rate. And we did a survey of the county and we ask them, how do they get their food? Where do they get their food from? There's not a grocery store here. For Tolliver County, not just Crawfordville itself, but including Sharon and some of the other areas around, they need that exposure to healthier options. So Healthier Together Tolliver is a collaborative project between the University of Georgia and the College of Public Health. The first part of the project was working with the JW Fannin Institute for Leadership Development and community stakeholders, both elected officials, um, people who are interested and involved with nutrition, health, wellness, um, community volunteers, and trying to identify people that could build a strong community collaborative um, so that we could have a coalition to identify resources that were already in existence. Uh, we've just opened a one acre community garden in Sharon, Georgia which has a lot of potential to um, provide not only an opportunity for individuals to have a raised bed of their own, but also to have plant a row type projects that would be open to the community. This evening we're doing our awards program. We have a, a Tolliver uh, walking challenge. We gave the uh, community pedometers and they were to keep up with their steps. And so this is the end of it tonight. We're here tonight to celebrate that. We've also been working with our school systems to enhance our 4-H and youth education. And it's been real exciting to see how willing they've been to um, support um, our health education. It's about starting small. Um, starting with the school and getting initiative started here with 4-H and then now taking it to the next step to Healthier Together Tolliver and involving more of the community and bringing people in from Sharon and you know the people from Crawfordville. So I think starting those small steps makes it easier to get people to buy in. I think in any small community you need to pull as many groups as you can together with the University Extension Program coming in and helping us and then we work with the Tolliver County Family Connection through the commissioners, 
and other groups, our churches, if small communities can do so much if they will all pull together. So we are excited about the lessons that we've learned through this project and we hope that we can take some of those lessons and create models that we can share throughout Extension to make the healthy choice, the easy choice in all communities throughout Georgia. Finally today, if you think Kenny and I are a couple of fast talkers, you ain't heard nothing. From our friends at Virginia Farm Bureau comes this, the 40th Annual Virginia State Auctioneer Championship. Dave Miller reports. There was plenty of excitement in the air for the state's auctioneer championship as bidders called out and auctioneers worked the crowd. Good auctioneers know that it's not just the chance to buy prized merchandise, but the competition between buyers that helps them deliver the best value for their customers. And that's why auctions continue to be popular with some buyers and sellers. There's a lot of auctions going on. Real estate is on the rise. Um, the collectible industry, if you will, has to be extremely quality uh, for it to really bring the money. Your average household items uh, aren't doing as well as they, they were at one time, but your collectibles uh, as far as very nice antique furniture, stoneware, uh, art, and things of that nature are doing, are doing well. The cattle industry is good. The horse industry is extremely strong. Um, so, you know, the auction, the auction industry in the Commonwealth is alive and well, extremely, extremely vigorous right now. The skills, the ability, and the quality of Virginia auctioneers are tested each year at the Auctioneers Contest at the State Fair of Virginia. Auctioneers get the chance to perform before a group of judges and in competition with other auctioneers from around the state. Daniel Lanier of Pennsylvania County won bragging rights when he was chosen 2017 state champion. For an auction or an auctioneer, it's true price discovery. We, we build a competitive buying experience. It's not like going to a yard sale where they say it's worth $5 and you pay $5. You might think it's worth five, we get 25 for it. You know, that, that's what we do. We, we do everything we can to make every dollar possible for our sellers. Auctions are used to sell everything from farm equipment and automobiles to real estate and collectibles in the Old Dominion. Charles Nichols says auctions are also a tradition here in Virginia one that has been around for many generations. There are people now, because of the changing way of uh, eBay and so forth, people going to Craigslist and putting their items on, which really is just an auction in itself. And so what they see is that there is a way for me to maintain the most money that I can maintain, and I'd rather put it in a competitive bidding scenario and that's what the auction process is but for me I just see that the auction profession um, over the generations over the years um, there's still two people that want the same item and then you see that from families and they say you know my grandfather had an auction he did really well I'm going to do the same thing and it works out that way. It's evident by the energy that competitor Wendy Grimms brings to the stage that she is totally immersed in the auction process. This was Grimms' first state competition, and she enjoyed it. Well, I am a second-generation auctioneer. My father actually got into it back in the 70s, so I grew up in the auction industry. I've been around it my entire life. Um, I just started actually selling about a year and a half ago myself and I absolutely love it. It's so much fun. It's fun to be up on stage. There's definitely right now a big shift to online auctions so we're kind of starting to experiment with that a little but also keeping the live outcry auctions. They're the most fun. <laughs> Next time you see an auction classified in the paper or you come across one online just jump in your car and go. They are fun. There's usually food and it's going to be an exciting fun day. You will not regret it and you might find something that you just couldn't live without. Online auctions are more popular than ever on the internet as buyers watch the bids come in and click on the bid button on their own screen. But there's nothing like the excitement of a traditional live auction, the competition of the sale between the buyers and the audience present and the fevered pitch of the auctioneer provide the driving force behind the entire sales event. In Caroline County, this is Dave Miller. Well, that's fast, and so is our goodbye. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.